So welcome to our speaker series. My name is Jesse Rack. I'm the program director. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I need to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, so the restrooms and water fountains are just back around that hallway. Just keep taking rights and it's over on that side if you need them. Um, I also want to remind you real quick that we are a 501c nonprofit and we exist because of your support. So if you like the free stuff that we do like this, um, we have some fish bowls in the lobby. You're welcome to drop a couple dollars in or anything helps. Um, just let us know and stay tuned after the talk. Our, uh, one of our board members is going to make a quick uh, announcement to you as well. Um, also, if you're interested in non-monetary ways to show your support, because it's fine. Um, we also do volunteering, so if you'd like to, to know more about that, ask me about that. Um, a couple of upcoming events you might be interested in. Uh, if you're really jazzed about this talk tonight with Olivia, um, we actually also have a bee workshop going on this Saturday. We have five spots left um, in our native bee field workshop. It's getting to know our native bees. So Dr. Carroll will expand on what she shares tonight. Everyone gets a net. You get to learn to catch and hold native bees and get some tips on how to photograph them. So we'll meet here at NHI at at 8 a.m. Uh, we're still kind of TBD if we're gonna be around town because of the weather or go further out. We'll let you all know on Friday. We'll just come here and we'll figure it out. Um, it's $65 a person. So see me afterward if you wanna sign up for one of those spots if you're like, have more questions and can't wait to see it in the field. So um, also, if you didn't get a chance to check out our gallery before the talk, it'll also be open afterward. Um, so the current art e exhibition fe features the late Adele Sarand, and it's called Art, Nature, Spirit. So um, she was a visionary, a painter, a poet, a gardener, and a social activist. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, check it out. If the work speaks to you, I'd like to invite you to return this same place, same location, same time next week on August 4th for our featured artist talk presented by Adele's son, Antoine Sarand. And so that's called Earth as a Sacred Garden, Art, Nature, and Spirit. And I forgot to do this thing, but Earth as a Sacred Garden. <laughs> so there's that flyer. That's also free. You just sign up the same way as you did with Eventbrite. Here's the field workshop that's going on Saturday. So finally, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Olivia Messenger Carroll. Uh, Dr. Carroll comes to us all the way from Santa Fe. This is her first time in Prescott, so we really brought like our best monsoons for her this week. <laughs> Make sure we don't see many bees. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, so Olivia has been studying native bees for 25 years, over 25 years. Uh, she received her BS and Master's from Utah State University and a PhD from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Um, she's currently conducting several large-scale surveys of bees throughout the Western United States and studying several rare plants in, Mexi in New Mexico, um, for which you have both a BLM grant and a Forest Service grant. Is that? Yeah. So nothing like having federal agencies compete over you. Am I right? Yeah. So she also has a pretty massive list of peer-reviewed publications and is the co-author of three books, one of which will be available after the talk, The Bees in Your Backyard, um, as well as, oh, sorry, it's a field guide to North America's bees. Also, the common bees of Eastern North America and the soon-to-be-released common bees of Western North America. As if that isn't enough, in her spare time, she works as a middle school science teacher. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, and also hangs out with her two daughters, who sound totally cool. I think they're in the presentation. They're super adventurous. They help their mom collect and camp all summer. Um, and she also hangs out with her handsome husband, her cat, two dogs, five chickens, and two hamsters. So <laughs> who I don't think help you collect as much. Is this accurate? Yeah. <laughs> so with all of that, um, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Olivia Carroll with her talk, It's Complicated, Native Bees and Their Flowers. Hi, everybody. Is this still working? Okay. All right. This is weird having this on. <laughs> I am so happy to be here. I can just kind of feel the excitement coming off of you, and so it's going to be fun to share tonight. Um, I wanted to start with just a little introduction about me. I've been collecting bees for a long time, and for years I did it all by myself. But then I had these two little ones, and so now I collect either with a human attached to my body or somewhere close behind. 
I made this, the mistake last summer of telling them that I would pay them $5 a bee to go collect with me, and I had to cut them off after $75. Uh, they got good really fast, and I see potential for field researchers soon. Uh, they're very enthusiastic. This is my technique as well. This is how I collect. I'm kidding. That's not at all how I do it. <laughs> um, I love what I do. I love to be outside looking at bees on their flowers, and it's really easy and obvious to see the connection. It's like this tangible ecological connection. If you read through textbooks all the time, they talk about ecological connections and they draw pictures and there's all these models of them. But when you're looking at a bee and a flower, it's very, it's manifested perfectly. You can really see it. Um, most people, when I say that I study pollination, more than once people have said Polynesians, but um, <laughs> then I say, no, 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 I study bees. And when I do, most people assume I'm talking about this insect. Who can tell me what this one is? What's this? Bee. It is a bee. What kind of bee is this? Honey bee. Very good. This is a honeybee. Yes. This is one of our most common bees. When people hear the word bee, this is what comes to mind. I tend to think of them as kind of the black sheep of the bee world. <laughs> Not really a good representative of the bees that we find most commonly in North America. So let me walk you through the honeybee first and then we'll compare it to the other ones. So the honeybee is one species. There are more species in the same genus. The genus is Apis around the world, but the one that we use for honey production here in North America is Apis mellifera. There's just one species. Um, it's highly social, which means it lives in a hive. All of them are living together, maybe 10,000, maybe more individuals all together in one place um, where they divide up tasks that have to be done. So the queen's job is to lay eggs. There are workers whose job it is to collect pollen, others who collect nectar, some who clean up after the queen, some who take care of the offspring, some who find new homes. All of those jobs are divided up among the different bees that are in there. They have perennial colonies that can last for many years, and the queen even, that one queen, can last for five years that one individual can stay alive. And because they're perennial, that means they have to make it through the winter. Most of the bees that I'll be talking about tonight, you don't see them in the winter. They're not around, and they're not in their adult form in the winter. So they're, I'll talk about that in a minute. But these guys are in their adult form. They're grown-up bees, and so they need something to eat. So honey is preserved flowers. It's canned flowers. I can tomatoes. I can applesauce, all of these different things, so that I have fruits and vegetables to eat in the winter. Bees can flowers. That's what honey is. Um, so, other bees, not so much on the honey front. They're semi-domesticated. We can't call them truly domesticated because we're not totally in control of who mates with who, but um, we have more say over these bees than we do any of the others, and we have for a really long time. Our relationship with the honeybees is an old one. And they're not from, oops, that was the wrong button. Let's try this again. There we go. And they're not native to North America. So they were brought over here a couple different times, over 400 years ago. I have a friend who likes to say they were brought for sweetness and light. They were brought for their wax and for the honey that they have. Um, so let's talk about, let's contrast those. Um, so the honeybee, get this in your mind now, the honeybee is a little bit like chicken. Right? This wonderful animal that's semi-domesticated. I have five of these. I don't understand them, but they're sure fun to watch. Uh, compare that to this. Boy, that's a tricky button there. Did I get it? There we go. A native solitary bee. This is a more typical bee right here. So let's talk about the ways that this differs from the honeybee so that you can get to know it a little bit. Um, for starters, bees come in a lot of different sizes. When you think bee, it's, it's easy to think that it must be honey bee size, but bees can range from a little bit bigger than a quarter. I believe you have these around here. Maybe you've seen these, the big carpenter bees, all the way down to quite a bit smaller than a quarter. And in fact, they come even smaller than that. This one right here is Perdita minima. This is a small mining bee. It's found in New Mexico, Arizona, and Southern California. And this is the smallest bee in North America. It's found right here. It's a specialist on a little tiny plant called a leafy spurge. And that is to scale. It was taken with that quarter. 
Most of these bees don't nest in hives. None of them are truly in a hive. Most of them actually nest in the ground. About 70% of our native solitary bees are ground nesting species. So this is one of my favorite ones. This is a bee called a diadesia is the genus. It's a, this one's a mallow bee, so it only visits um, globe mallow flowers when collecting pollen. And here she is building her nest. She's in the middle of a dirt road. High traffic, I don't understand why they do this, but she had about 100 relatives all around here also building their own little home. So from this, maybe you can understand that these bees, by solitary, what I really mean is that they're, sing they're more like single moms, right? So each mom builds her own nest. She gathers pollen and nectar that she takes back to that nest all by herself. It's just her in there. Um, and then she lays the eggs in there. So then there's no division of labor for these solitary bees that we're mostly talking about tonight. Um, most of these bees nest in the ground, but they don't all have the same sort of nest entrance. There's all sorts of different kinds of nest entrances. And really, if you don't see the bee go into it, it's kind of hard to know it's a bee nest. So keep looking for them, but if you don't find them, they're probably there. They're just kind of hard to see. If you do find one, the way that scientists like to study this is they get a little like um, um, chalk, a little chalk powder, and you can put it in the nest entrance and it'll make, ooh, let's see if I can use this. It'll make like a little white line right here. See that white line? And you can follow that white line down with a trowel. And at the bottom of the long main shaft, you'll find a series of little tiny rooms. Each one of these is its own separate little room. And inside each of those rooms will be a ball of pollen. And the female will lay an egg right on the top of that. When the egg hatches, the little larva consumes all of that pollen. Sometimes the mom will backfill this nest. But that bee, that baby, is left in a little nursery all by itself in the dark, in the ground, to grow up. Brothers and sisters are in separate little nurseries off to the side. <clears throat> um, typically these are, I don't know, three inches to a foot under the ground. They're not typically that deep, but they can get deep. Uh, this is my mentor, Terry Griswold. He found a, a bee nest in uh, south central Utah, a place called the San Rafael Swell. And he was really curious to know a little bit more about this, so he got out his trowel and the chalk powder and started digging and had to switch to the shovel in the back of the car. And by the end of the day, they finally found what they believed to be the bottom, and it was nine feet underground for a bee that's about a third of an inch in size. So the thought is, and it took me a long time to truly understand what was happening here, is that that little bee uh, is one of a series of generations that have probably used the same nest entrance, but each generation digs a little bit further down. Some bees nest in wood. This is a leaf cutter bee, a little megachile. She's bringing back a little bit of wallpaper to line the insides of her nest and make it perfect for her offspring. Um, it's just a little bit of leaf material. Any of you have lilac or rose roses? You've seen the perfect little hole punches cut out of them? Probably one of these. She likes to take that and use it. Um, if you look inside, it'll either be little lined pieces or maybe she'll chew them up and use them. And so what happens, oh, that's the Michael Phelps flip there. Do you see her flip around? And then all the pollen that's on the underside of her body, she will dump off in there. So this is a series <coughs> of, of, of little nurseries. So here's pollen. There's an egg in front of that and a wall, because you know how siblings fight. You have to separate them. And then pollen, another egg, another wall, pollen, egg, wall, so that each of the offspring is separated inside with just the one entrance. Um, here's one, a little more origami-like. She's folded up, made little envelopes out of leaf material. And what's really cool about this is that if you think about it, the one at the back is probably going to be fully developed and ready to go a lot sooner than the one at the front because it got a head start at development, right? So either it's going to be impatiently waiting back there, or maybe it's going to dig its way through everybody to get out and get going with adult life. Um, one of the things that females are known to do to sort of counter this impatience of the ones in the back is to, she can pick the sex of her offspring at the time that she lays an egg. So if, if the bee is going to be a female, it's a fertilized egg. When she's mated, she stores the sperm in her body, and at the time that she lays an egg, she can release sperm and fertilize it. Uh, males are unfertilized eggs, so she can make males without mating with another bee. So what she does is the females, who tend to be more complicated, they have more genes, 
I don't know why I'm more complicated. I, I have the same as my husband, but there we go. Uh, females go at the back and males are at the front, and then hopefully more or less everyone's time is the same. Some bees will nest in sandstone. This is a really cool one. It might occur not too far from here. We don't actually have records of it yet, but there's enough sandstone around here. It seems possible, it or a relative. Um, and then other things that they'll use inside can be things like little bits of uh, wool, the trichomes, the fuzz off of some plants. If you'll watch, she has a little ball of it there. You can take it back to the nest and use it to pad the inside. So there she is going into her nest with it. Uh, other materials that they'll use are petals. Rose petals are one option. All sorts, onagraceae, um, evening primrose petals have been used in nests that I've seen. Some bees nest in snail shells. And some bees that nest in the ground will actually paint the inside with a secretion that they make from their bodies and waterproof line the inside of the nest so when it rains or the soil gets kind of mucky, uh, their babies are protected inside. Male bees don't have much to do with the nest making or the, they don't have anything to do with it. They don't, they don't. Uh, or the pollen collecting or the nectar collecting or any of that stuff. Um, but the male bees, spend the days sort of fighting with each other for territories where females might come. They want to be the first to be the only to mate with her. Uh, but then at night they huddle up together in little bachelor pads, which is very odd. The ones in my yard, the ones in my yard like to nest in flowers that close up at night. This is a globe mallow. If you want something fun to do, ki uh, there's kids in here. Go out at night just before you go to bed and find the globe mallow flowers that have closed and squeeze them, just a little squeeze. Uh, and the little bee inside will buzz back at you. It's really fun. I, in my next life, would like to be a male bee and sleep in a flower, just for one night, just to see what that's like. Uh, squash flowers, the same way. Squash flowers tend to close a little bit and wilt kind of early, and you can squeeze those and find bees in them, too. All right, so let's walk through the life cycle of one of these. And I think I need to start by saying that, you know, when you look at, go to the grocery store in March or April, you know, you find your first strawberries are there, and then you come a little later, and cherries come on, and then peaches, um, and then watermelons are somewhere in there. There's a seasonality to all of our fruits and vegetables that depends, ultimately, on when those plants flowered, right? Well, the bees, which are so closely tied to these, are also seasonal. So there are bees associated with each of the seasons that we have. So I'm showing you an early spring bee here, but I could have just as easily made this a summer bee or even a fall bee. There are bees that emerge in the fall. Um, just shift it around. But let's pretend we're talking about an early spring bee. Uh, they emerge as soon as they can, as soon as they feel that the temperature and, and humidity and, and um, moisture and all of those things are just right. Uh, the males tend to emerge first, and they begin sort of hovering over the ground, assuming a ground nesting bee, waiting for the females. If they can hear her or smell her in the ground, they can, they've been known to dig down to find her before she's totally made her way up out of her nest cell uh, to be the first to mate with her. But as soon as the females come out, they begin foraging and building nests and making as many babies with as much pollen as possible before their life is over, because by summer, th those bees are gone. So the adult portion of a bee's life, roughly two months. It's not actually that long. When you think of a whole year as a life cycle, 10 months of that is spent developing into the adult that's going to come out, right? In the ground, alone, in the dark. And then, of course, whatever larvae are developing in the nest will overwinter in some form of almost adulthood, early teen. And then uh, in the next spring, they'll come out again. There's lots of variations on this, as you might imagine. There's all sorts of ways that this could be um, changed and mixed up and stuff. One of my favorite ways is bet hedging. So this is especially common in the Southwest, uh, where bees may or may not experience really dry years. And if it's going to be really dry, maybe that's not the best year to come out of your nest. And so <coughs> it's been shown that a number of bees can can hedge their bets. They can bet that even though this year doesn't feel like it's going to be a good year, it's hot too early, it's too dry, the soil doesn't feel right, they can wait in their yet bet nest, betting that the next year will be better and emerge then. And some bees have been shown to do this for up to seven years. They can wait in their nest before they come out. So what you see in any one year is pretty amazing, but think too of the seeds, if you will, that are in the ground still waiting to come. 
Many of these bees are specialists, which means that even when there's all sorts of different flowers that they could visit, they limit themselves to one, usually genus, maybe a family of plants when collecting pollen to take back to feed to their offspring. So this isn't for them. They're not specializing in that they're eating it, but what they feed to their babies, they're very particular about. It's a little like Cheers in that you have, you could go to any bar you want, but if you always go back to the same one, even when you have other options, you're more like, like those guys there. Uh, we think there's between 20 and 30,000 bee species around the world. We don't really know. We're still figuring this out. New bee species are being found all the time. I did a study I'll talk about in a little bit in South Central Utah, and we found over 60 new species in just that one area. So if you take that and multiply it by the other areas of Arizona and California and all over that haven't been explored, there's lots still to be found. Plus, you add into that that you have two kinds of people who identify bees. You have the lumpers and the splitters. So the splitters are the people that take a group of bees. It's some grad student very excited about a new group, and they turn what was 10 species into 15. And then the next grad student comes along and turns them into five. So the numbers are constantly changing depending on who's working on different groups. And so we have to be flexible there. We think there's between 3,500 and 4,000 in the US and Canada. And here in Arizona, over 1,000 species. That's quite a few. For comparison, east of the Mississippi River, we think there's around 770 species in all of those states combined together. So if we break this down by the different states, you can see that in general, moving from north to south and from east to west, bee species richness increases. So those both come together in the southwest, and the southwest has the highest bee species richness of the entire United States. Um, you want to go to the tropics to study butterflies or birds or beetles, but bees, this is, this is the place to be. Uh, California kind of takes the cake. There's 1,600 different species there in California, but that makes sense. It's a really long state. It also has the highest and lowest points and some really interesting habitats you don't find elsewhere. But New Mexico and Arizona are competing for second place. So how do we know all of this stuff about bees? Well, I study bees by kind of taking like a blood sample, right? You don't take all the blood. You just take a little bit and take it and figure out. So I go out with a net and I collect bees I euthanize them so that I have a specimen, and I take them back to the lab where I put handles on them. The pin is a little handle so I can manipulate it. And I have to do this because the only way to figure out what species I'm looking at is to look under a microscope. To give you an example, sometimes figuring out the difference between two species is looking at things like how pointy it is right here, which of course you can't see in the field when the bee's in your net squirming around. So take one or two back to look at button. Uh, so then I end up with all of these bees in my lab, and it's easy sometimes as I'm working through a really difficult group and trying to figure out what I'm looking at. It's easy to forget the relationship that that bee had with the plants and with its ecosystem and all of that stuff. Even in the field sometimes when I'm looking at a bee on a flower, or maybe when you're in your backyard looking at the same thing, maybe you just see the bee and the flower, but don't really think about the connection between the two of them. And if you do, it's probably related to how tasty your food is, right? We all think about bees in terms of what they provide for us, in terms of the color and variety on our plates. Um, to give you an example of that, this is a menu from a very fine cafe, also known as my kitchen. Um, here are some of the things that perhaps you would find. This is not at all what I cook in my house, <laughs> but just pretend. <laughs> Uh, we have spinach artichoke dip. We have house-made salsa. I have a seven and a nine-year-old. We, we eat rice a lot. Um, we have spicy Italian sausage and some Greek salad. I put BLTs on there. Barbecue chicken wrap. Maybe this is what I wish it was like. Uh, lamb chops, shrimp scampi, eggplant parmesan. Takes too long. And then pie. That's my favorite dessert, so I put pie up there. So let's imagine if we didn't have bees plentifully pollinating and providing seeds and fruits for us, what it might look like. We'd pretty much have to get rid of the house-made salsa. Everything in salsa is bee pollinated. Uh, our, our soup gets a little more boring. It's, not, it's sausage and potatoes. I mean, that's not bad. Uh, Greek salad's not quite what it used to be. 
Our BLT is missing a lot of the ingredients in there. Chili, oh, chili's gone, honey's gone, zucchini's gone, all of these things that we like. And truly, it's, I say gone, none of this is actually gone. It's just that the other pollinators who pollinate these things, like flies and all of the other stuff that we find, don't pollinate as efficiently, as quickly, as effectively. And so all of this would become a lot more expensive. It would be very expensive to eat all of those foods. So our menu might look a little more like this. Our BLT is now a B. Uh, shrimp scampi. Uh, you know, the rice is still there. The par mozzarella parmesan, we've lost our, our eggplant parmesan isn't quite what it used to be. And pies are all gone, which is pretty sad. Uh, but we can take this a step further, too, because a lot of the dairy products that we eat are the result of, of dairy cattle being fed alfalfa, which is pollinated by bees. So let's get rid of all our dairy. And now we're left with kind of a boring menu. Pretty much we have meat and grains. That's all that's left. So um, not quite so good. So this is maybe where our brains go if we're thinking about bees and flowers. But seldom do we really consider what bees are doing across a ginormous landscape. One bee is visiting lots and lots of flowers, but then multiply that by all the bees that are out there visiting all of the flowers. And it gets pretty complicated. And so to demonstrate that, I put together, uh, this is how ecologists tend to model those really complex landscapes, right? Looking at something like this, it's hard to make sense of all that's happening out there in terms of the bees and the flowers. So we simplify it, wrap our minds around it with something like this. So here's some flowers that are found commonly in the southwest. These are ones I find in my yard even, uh, in Santa Fe. You probably find them here too. And here's a couple bees that are very common. These can be found all over everywhere. So let's walk through how those bees and those flowers are related. Uh, the Melisodes, that's a male Melisodes longhorn bee. Uh, many of them are specialists on sunflowers. So we can draw a line from the bee just to that sunflower. But that, it's actually the sunflower family, so we should draw a line to both of those. Uh, the Osmia up there, the mason bee, there's a couple that prefer only penstemon. That's the only thing that they want to visit. So we'll draw a line like that. Bumblebees fly for a really long period of time. They have these long seasons. And so they visit pretty much everything. They're generalists. And then our green metallic sweat bees are kind of the same way, and they visit just about everything. And so you can see through these connections now that not only is that bee connected to its flower, but it's connected to other bees through their interactions on those flowers. And in fact, it's connected to all the flowers. Everything ends up connected. And it's interesting to think about this because then we can imagine, well, what would happen if we were to take something away, right? It's not as simple as just that mason bee going away because, well, its flower isn't there anymore. But the bees that were on that have to shift something else. And now there's probably a little more competition whoop, can keep that, on some of the other plants because there's more bees visiting those. We can take it the other way, too, and say what would happen if we added a flower. What if an invasive species were to come in? And now we have this in there. Invasive species happen to be invasive partly because bees love them. They're super popular with the bees. They get visited all the time. They set tons of seeds and they grow like crazy. They, they are prolific with nectar. They have decent pollen depending on the one. And so oftentimes lots of bees will move on to these invasive plants. And what, ch what happens when that, that little plant comes in is that our network stops being connected in the same way that it was before. Some of the connections that were there split apart, and now we have isolated groups within there where once it was all connected. So I want to show you this with some real world examples, some actual pollinator networks that have been done. This is one of my favorites just because it's so beautiful. And I'm kind of a history fan, and this one goes way back in time. So this is one from, um, there was a man named Charles Robertson who lived in Illinois like 130 years ago now. And he was very fastidious in his note taking. He took excellent notes. And he documented every bee visiting every plant in an area where he was interested in doing some field work. Um, really cool that he did this. In my mind, I'm imagining he was out there like on a horse getting to his field site. Man, my kids would love it if that's how I collected. And so anyway, these, these scientists revisited the areas. Do you want to know, you know, know what he looked like? This is what he looked like. There you go. Uh, these scientists came back, and because we still have all of his data from so long ago, 
they were able to revisit those same plants 120 years later and see what had changed in terms of bee plant interactions. And they focused on just 26 of those flowers and created a pollinator network that looks like this. Yeah, it's a little complicated, it's not bad. Uh, on the, um, what side is this? The right side are all of the bees and on the left side are the 26 plants. Obviously the 26 plants are all still there um, because otherwise that wouldn't make any sense. Um, but 109 of the bee species that he originally found were there. Many of them were gone. So you can see in red the ones that they didn't collect on those plants. Um, so they found lots and lots of changes in those networks over time, which is kind of interesting. Um, obviously not because the flowers were gone, but because the bees were. We need to be careful here with the word gone, though, because many of the bees that were on those plants are generalists, or if we look closely, many of them are kleptoparasites. So these are these incredible bees that do like a cuckoo bird does, and they sneak into a bee's nest when the, the host bee, the mama bee, isn't home and lay an egg. And when that egg hatches, it'll have these giant mandibles and it snips the other bee in half and then eats the pollen that's in there. It's very sneaky. But those bees don't collect any pollen, so they don't really care what plants they visit. So the fact that they weren't found doesn't necessarily mean they were gone. Perhaps they're on an invasive plant that's come in in the last 120 years. So drawing the conclusion that those bees are no longer in the area isn't what we can really say from this, just that the network has changed really dramatically in 120 years. So let's look at one more here. We also don't know how much he sampled compared to how much we should sample now. He didn't write down how long he worked. Um, this is from my master's work. I did this in, uh, when did I do this? 2000 to 2003. It was a long master's. Um, and this is Grand Staircase Escalani National Monument. So it's a very large area, about 2 million um, acres in south central Utah. You can kind of see where they're roughly 50 miles by 100 miles in size. And um, they were really interested to know what bees they had and asked if I would come out and sample them. Perfect master's project. So I got a, a crew of people and we went out for four years for um, six months of each field season. So from April through October, um, every two weeks we collected in a series of plots that were always collected in the same way. So we could compare across time, we could compare between plots, we could compare over years, et cetera, et cetera. Really nice data set to work with. In all, we found 660 bee species in this area, about 80,000 individuals from 1,600 days of collecting. And in the plots, which are those yellow dots that you see on there, red spots where we saw a cool flower and just stopped to collect. But the yellow squares where we stopped, we found about 72% of all of the bees in our plots. So our plots are pretty representative of everything overall. And we've got great bee plant data for those plots because we sampled them so regularly over time. Um, so here I made this just to show you a plant pollinator network for one of those plots in one of those years. The yellow there, yellow orange, is bees and the, there were 15 plants across the, the season that I collected this. So those are the flowers down there in blue. And so I can take this now and I can look at it across the season. So these are the connections that were there in May and then in June. And then in July, nothing really happened in July. It was really kind of a dry time before the monsoons come on. And then August, some more things. And then, oop, almost did it again, September. So now we have this completed network, but you can see sort of a time component added into that. And what's really interesting to see is that when you look at any one month by itself, it feels pretty isolated. But through these little hubs, these, these bees that seem to think of them as like, Anyone know the Kevin Bacon seven degrees of separation game, right? These are, these are the Kevin Bacons. They're the ones that hold everything together and establish how many degrees of separation to get from the spring all the way through to the fall. Um, everything ends up connected across the season, usually based on a few kind of common things, which is neat. So we've talked about them and they, it's beautiful. Is that beautiful? Is it just me? I think it's beautiful. So we get this sense from looking at bees and their flowers that they have this amazing, beautiful relationship that's evolved over time to be what it is and has led to the diversity in floral form and color and scent and size and shape of all of the flowers that we see out there. Thank goodness for bees to do this for us. But we need to remember too that even though it's led to this incredible diversity in, in the way the landscape looks, 
It's also a little fraught. Um, it's not perfect. If you think about this for a minute, pollen is, pollen is the equivalent of like the cash, right, that they both want. So every bit of pollen that gets back to a bee's nest makes another baby, right? So the more pollen that gets there, the more babies are made. As a biologist, we tend to call that fitness, and the most fit individuals are the ones that make the most offspring that then survive to make more offspring, right? But on the other hand, the flowers, every bit of pollen that ends up on a stigma makes a seed, and that's their definition of fitness. So every bit of pollen that ends up in a nest means less fitness for the plant and vice versa. So we have this interesting sort of love-hate relationship going on where they both need each other, they require each other most of the time, but they're also trying to manipulate each other for the best advantage. So um, Charles Darwin was one of the first people to really study what we now call this sort of exploitation that's happening between the two of them. And he said, I do not believe that any animal in the world performs an action for the exclusive good of another of a distinct species. Yet each species tries to take advantage of the instincts of the others, right? So that kind of summarizes in a nutshell what's happening with these bee plant relationships. You can call it sort of a balanced mutual exploitation. So let me show you a few ways that this happens that are really interesting to kind of think about when you watch bees on their flowers. Uh, this one here is a lovely little bee visiting an Arctostaphylus. You guys have, what's the common name for Arctostaphylus? Manzanita. Manzanita. Uh, Manzanita is pretty common around here. It occurs throughout the southwest. It has these narrow tubular little flowers, and to get at the pollen inside, you have to be a skilled bee that can land upside down on the flower and shake your body. You have to disconnect your wing muscles from your wings and then shake vibrate those wing muscles and the pollen comes out like a salt shaker, lands on your body and you can take it back. If you're too big or not skilled enough at doing that, there's still good nectar in there. So many of these bees will land on the end. I don't know if you can tell, there's a hole in the end of that flower right there that this bee has cut. She's cut a hole and stolen all of the nectar out of there. Now no one wants to land on this flower because now there's no nectar reward for being there. So she's decreased the chance of that flower being pollinated by stealing the nectar out of it. Uh, here's another example. So that was a bee that was maybe too big to get the job done. But tiny bees are also a problem. This is one of those little tiny mining bees right here, small mining bees. And it's only visiting the anthers. And the chances of it coming in contact with the stigma are pretty small. It's not going to be the best pollinator for this plant. You guys have this one here, Rocky Mountain bee plant? Yeah, OK. Um, so there's another example. Here's, here's an example going the other way of a flower manipulating a bee. So this is an orchid that you can find in Europe. <clears throat> a lovely, beautiful orchid. It's kind of amazing. It grows in really poor soils, um, but it has these great relationships with the mycorrhizae in the soil that help it do OK. And it also like, makes flowers that look like very attractive female bees. Um, in case you couldn't tell, that's what that was. Maybe from this angle, you can see these are the antenna here. All right, here's the back legs. Look at this little bum, so cute. Uh, the males think this is a female bee. The orchid emits these horm hormones, these scents, these floral volatiles that smell like a female bee. And the male, feeling like opportunity has presented itself, will land on this and try and mate with this female. Um, and when it does, these little tiny pollen grains right up here get lodged on the back in that spot you can't scratch right between your shoulder blades there. The bee flies away frustrated, regains its composure, and then goes on to another flower and repeats it and pollinates the flower. So here's a case of male bees actually being pretty good pollinators um, and the flower being very sneaky. Um, here's another fun example of a bee and a flower that have worked together compete, I don't know what the word for this is, uh, but they've, there's this fascinating relationship. This is in South Africa, and this bee has incredibly long forelegs that it uses to reach deep inside of a twin spur flower and grab the floral oils at the back of the little, little I'll show you here, so you can see, it reaches, reaches to the back of these tubes right here, 
to pull out the rewards and in the process pollinates the flower. And what's so cool about this is they've found that the length of the forelegs on the bee and the length of the spurs on this flower are um, correlated in different areas. So in some areas, both will be extra long and in other areas, they'll be short. So they're very specific to where they are, which is kind of neat. Um, here's one, you don't have to go to Africa to see some of these fun relationships. This here is a, a group of bees that are quite common in the Western United States, and they tend to visit flowers that have the pollen on the top. It's like a tubular flower, and the pollen's kind of at the top. So when the bee sticks its head into the flower and kind of tips up to get its tongue out so that it can get to the nectar at the back, those hairs right there, those little corkscrew hairs hit the pollen and have to tend to pull the pollen out of the flower. It's a great little adaptation. And then finally here, I'll show you this one. This is a Dionomia. This is a bee that's found here as well and specializes on sunflowers. It only visits sunflowers. And it can take the pollen off of one sunflower, all the pollen, and make three to four offspring from just the pollen on that one flower. So everything it needs from one flower. Obviously, that's very bad for the flower. So the flower has a very clever strategy. It releases the pollen very slowly over time so that the bee has to move on to another if it wants to keep collecting pollen on a given day. And um, over a course of eight days, it finally releases all of its pollen, but it doesn't get scooped by the bee all in one day. All right. Um, you really don't have to know any of this. None of this is stuff that's necessarily important. And if you didn't know it, the bee and the flower would still continue to kind of do their thing together. They would still continue to evolve and love and hate each other as they work together. It's not like it changes anything to know this, except that I think of bees as sort of like they're the gateway bug, right? This is a gateway bug. Uh, and by, by understanding and learning to appreciate and celebrate the really cool uh, interactions between these two, we might get a sense of all the interactions that can be playing out on any landscape, anywhere, at any time, and maybe start thinking about our ecosystems a little bit differently. So I will stop there and take any questions you guys might have all about bees and their flowers. particularly bad. Um, as you know, we, as maybe you now know, that we know so little about so many of these bees that we don't have quantifiable data to say that this bee has declined drastically. The only ones that have been really well studied in terms of numbers like that are the honeybees. Um, and we all know that story. That's different though. That's, that's totally different. And the bumblebees. We've, we've studied the bumblebees. They, they're in colonies. They're a little bit easier to get numbers on and they tend to be more common in collections, so then we end up with, with better records that we can look at over time. And of the, what is it, how many, 40-something 40, 40 different bumblebee species in North America, um, evidence suggests that maybe four or eight of them are in pretty serious decline. Like, a couple maybe are even gone. We're not really sure what's going on. So bumblebee-wise, there seems to be a couple that, on the other hand, there's some bumblebees that are becoming more common, and some that we just don't have enough data to say one way or another what's happening with them, which is kind of, you know, we got our work cut out for us. <laughs> um, so even within one genus, there seems to be very different things happening. We don't know if it's because of um, maybe there are more sus certain groups that are maybe more closely related to each other are more susceptible to different diseases, whether it has to do with climate change. Bumblebees tend to be more high elevation, more associated with a past time when the earth was much, much cooler, and maybe some of them just aren't handling the, the, the fast progress of climate change the same way. But for the rest of the bees, I mean, if we're still finding new species, 
Now we have evidence of it here at this one time, but we don't know what it was like 50 years ago to say one way or another. Um, even in the drought years, it's weird. I'm, and this is all new, right? So this is this mega drought stuff that's happening in the West is, is ongoing research for me right now. So I don't have any answers or conclusions yet, but even just in the, the areas where I am, I'll have a drought year and I'll think that's it. There's not gonna be anything. And then the next year when flowers come, even just a couple, the bees are right back. So it gives me the sense that maybe there's some resiliency in the bees in the face of drought and that sort of thing, just because they've probably been through it before in the last 60 million years that they've been around. So um, time will tell how they handle these changes in the future. Yeah, oh, I think she was before you and then you. Um, I was intrigued by your comment about that tiny little bee with the leafy spurs. And leafy spurs is certainly a horribly introduced plant, and yet we have a native bee that's specializes on it. So, so yes, so leafy spurge is one of those common names that can apply to many things, and I don't know of a common name that's specific, but the plant that it's on is called Camisaisi, and it's one particular leafy spurge that is native in here. And the flowers on that one are just, they're tiny little flowers. Yeah, and I don't know of it ever being found on the horribly annoying one that we get in our yards, yeah. Yeah. Are all the honeybees in the same genus? I mean, all the bumblebees in the same genus. All bumblebees are in the genus Bombus. Um, yeah, that's fair to say. All of them are in the, the same genus Bombus. There's a there's some interesting cuckoo bumblebees, so they kind of do the same kleptoparasitic thing. It's great, and they are they were Bombus, and I think they're now in their own own genus. They've been moved, or maybe they were moved under. I can't remember which way it went. So there's some close relatives that might be a bit different, but they're not true bumblebees. Um, we did lose all our European honeybees. Uh, we poll pollinate our European food plants. Uh, how much could our generalist native bees make up for that? We think probably pretty good. So the main problem isn't their ability to pollinate the flowers. They're actually, in, in many cases, have been proved to be equal to, if not better, at the pollination. The main problem is moving them, right? The thing that makes honeybees so awesome for us to use is that we can pick up 30,000 of them at once and set them in the middle of this field and then pick them up and move them somewhere else. So we, it's easy for us to manipulate them in that way. And it's much harder to do that with a ground nesting bee? How in the world are we gonna do that? There are some that will nest in wood blocks and you can drill a whole bunch of holes and then we can move the blocks around, but um, still hard. And the ones that are in the block that come out in March are different than the ones that'll be in the block in July. So you have to, it's a much more nuanced approach, but it has potential and there's lots of people studying it because they, they tend to do better. And in fact, what's really cool is that they found um, in many cases, when you have honeybees doing the majority of the pollinating, but you encourage the native bees to be in the area, right? So maybe in the hedges around or whatever, or you haven't sprayed and killed everything underneath so there's some food for them, the honeybees tend to do better work when faced with the competition from the native bees, which is really neat. Um, besides planting flowers, how can we support native bees and just bees in general to be more successful? Great question. Um, I'm kind of a bee optimist. Uh, from my experience, it seems that bees, I think secretly in their minds, they want to take over the world and they're just waiting for the opportunity. So anything you do, one little tiny thing, they will take advantage of that, um, always. They just, they're there and they're ready for, the, you give them an opportunity. So think of it like an Airbnb, right? So all they need is bed and breakfast. So you provide flowers for them, any sort of thing. I like, sunflowers are great to start with. Mint, if you can contain it and control it, works really good. If you wanna go with more native flowers, that's really great. Um, but then um, providing homes for them is really important that are near the flower patches that you've put in, whether that's undisturbed earth or earth that hasn't been sprayed with pesticides, no weed barriers, all of those sorts of things. Drill some holes in a piece of wood and let your kids watch what happens. It can be really fun. Um, 
So if you want to provide habitat, I think that's always a good idea. I don't think there's any reason, especially in the face of some of the fragmentation that happens as our cities grow, why not encourage them in that way? But for me, from my point of view, the other really big thing is getting people to understand who they are and what, that they have these amazing stories so that we learn to like celebrate and appreciate them for who they are and not for who honeybees are. Um, to me, if you go out tomorrow and talk to someone over coffee about native bees and someone else is turned on to them, I think that's, that's in the end going to be the best thing for them. Yeah, not to belabor the gentleman's question, but I'm curious if there is any agricultural fruit or vegetable that we all eat, essentially, that I would assume is grown on an industrial monocropped scale that you know is actually benefiting from our backyard bee pollinators? Our, our, our native the bee native, pollinators? The native bees, yeah. Yeah, so the first one that comes to mind that's really easy is alfalfa. Alfalfa cannot be pollinated by honeybees. They hate it. They hate it. it the, when you open the flower and try and mess with it, it whacks you in the head, and honeybees don't like it. But the native bees do quite well on it, and there's a couple that are really good pollinators of it that absolutely, um, and some that aren't. But uh, in addition to that, there's a, more and more and more of our, our orchards in the rosaceae, so things like cherries, um, yeah, all of those, those sorts of things are, are more and more pollinated by mason bees. That's a really big up and coming thing. Um, squash can be pollinated by either. I don't know of any cases where honeybees are excluded completely. But then when you go down to the tropics and get into some of the things that are happening down there, there's a whole bunch of plants, trees, a lot of our nuts and stuff that are pollinated by the native bees that are there that have nothing to do with honeybees. I have a few questions. Okay. Um, the first one, was that just a butterfly net that you use? Or I wish I brought one in. Net? It's in my car. Is it a special net or just like a butterfly? You can use a butterfly net. Okay. There's no problem with that. I tend to find them a little too wide. I got to swing fast. You got to be aggressive and get in there. Be, be aggressive. Be e e e aggressive. Yeah. Uh, and mine, mine, I have them custom made by somebody and it's a golf club handle. But the golf clubs removed, or the clubs removed from the end, and then it's got a piano wire for a hoop that's around, and then I sew my own nets to go on them, and it's like wedding veil material and like some canvas duck, um, and then I have like longer ones and shorter ones, and and it's also a great walking stick. So <laughs> they were, I, it's hard for me to walk without one at this point, but that's what I use. The the butterfly ones, there's a different swing to them, and it might be just because I'm so familiar with the other, but to me, they're, they're a little different. That's awesome. You like that? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, talk to me if you want. I can tell you how to get your own. My next question is, um, do you have a particular website that you prefer for identifying plants? Would you recommend? For plants? For, pla for plants, flowers. Um, here in Arizona? Or just a, a website, like an application? I use a couple. Okay. I, I'm growing quite fond of iNaturalist. I think that's a really great place to do it now, especially as more and more people get on there. You can take a photo and within an hour, three people have weighed in on it. And the, I, I found the bee IDs sometimes are good, sometimes aren't, but the flower IDs tend to be great, really good flower IDs. iNaturalist? I, I as in iPad, like the lowercase i, and then naturalist. I'm pretty new to this, so can you tell me what, when you refer to the mining bee, what does that mean, mining bee? It's called a mining bee because they all, the whole genus, maybe the whole, no, def, let's, so, let's stick with genus. The whole genus nests in the ground. So mining, they're digging down, yeah. And the genus, if you want to look it up and read more about it, the one I was talking about, so there's two, Andrena, A-N-D-R-E-N-A, and the other is the Perdida, and they're the teeny tiny little ones, Perdida, and there's a lot of them in Arizona, so they're a common one, and they come out mostly after monsoons, kind of taper just a little, so within the next couple weeks, you'll see them in abundance. They're fun. Yeah. I had another flower set I was going to say. Do you have one being around, from being around here? 
called Seek, like S E E K. That's sometimes nice. It's not always as accurate, but it's nice for like on the fly, very quick ones, because you don't have to take a picture and upload. You can just scan the area oh, and it gives you an idea of what it might be. Um, that's what I use. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, we have time. Let's take one more question. Then I think I'm we'll sticking around here. too. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Come see me in a minute. I'll okay. take his okay. and then come see me. Um, I'm back to your map of the U.S. for showing all the different species and the mother lotus here in the southwest. Why does only Florida only have like half as many different species? Florida would seem like right. It would, wouldn't it? And no, and relative to the states north of it, it does have more. Um, Nobody knows for sure. So all we have are a whole series of hypotheses that are really difficult to test to try and figure out why bee diversity is so great. But we, it's a pattern that holds true around the world. So if you go to um, the deserts of South America, if you go to deserts in, in Central Asia, if you go to Australia where it's all the deserts, that's where bee richness is greatest. Mediterranean climates, like the whole South France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, also really great for bees. So something about drier climates tends to be good. So what do we know about drier climates? They have a longer flowering season, and since bees tend to be pretty short-lived, that would mean there's lots more niches for different bees to be in an area that while it's flowering. They tend to have drier soils, so maybe all those ground nesting bees tend to do well there. Um, I have my own theory about the Southwest, but it wouldn't, I don't know that I could apply it to any of the other areas that because we end up with these years where everything is super connected because the flowers are everywhere and then a year where things dry up and the populations are more isolated, I wonder if speciation rates tend to be higher in areas where you get this pulse thing happening. Again, just a guess, all hypotheses that we haven't, <laughs> we don't really know for sure. Um, but yeah, we also find that if you go back east, the proportion of ground nesting to twig nesting bees tends to, like twig nesters tend to do better in eastern, so maybe something about those soils contributes as well. Yeah, and then, and I don't, I don't know enough about Florida. I should go to Florida. Hmm. Uh, I don't know enough to say for sure, but one thing we know in the tropics is that because the season lasts so long without changing very much, there's flowers that tend to last for a really long time rather than the like quick changes that happen here in like astragalus is out and then phacelia and then penstem and blah, blah, blah. Um, and maybe because of that, one bee can kind of hit the same thing over and over. Maybe Florida has the same plants and not the pulsing that we get here. I don't know. I, I am not sure about that. Maybe. Come see me. Okay. So thank you again to Dr. Olivia. Yeah. Hi, my name is John Farmer, and I'm here representing the Board of Directors for the Natural History Institute. And did you enjoy the program? Thank you. So here's the deal. We have incredible plans for the future with the Natural History Institute. And to continue this type of programming, we need your financial support. So whether it's giving to our annual campaign, making a one-time donation, considering a large major gift, including us as part of your estate plan, we would love to visit with you and find out what, why you love the Natural History Institute. You can contact Bob Ellis, Bob, raise your hand. He can put you in touch with our new development director that we just hired, or myself. And on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Natural History Institute, we sincerely thank you for your support, and please tell your friends and family about this organization and its mission. Thank you. Thank you.